Then he goes on, and then we're going to start to go off off tangent a little bit, but we'll see. So then, then he says, "The echad opens the pasuk." I said that the afia who meinian bishul elishi afia who bapas bishul he b'shari dvarim. So he explains why do I have to tell you that that something that is uh, roasted is also forbidden? He says because they're both really the same thing. You do, you basically you roast or you bake bread, and you boil other types of food. But it's he's telling you here now it's it's non consequential. It makes no difference what form of cooking you did. It's still forbidden. So if you cook with with any direct heat, with boiling, roasting, frying, cooking, any type of cooking with heat, you are breaking the Torah. Not rabbinic law only, but you're actually breaking the Torah. Then he goes on. He says, not only are we talking about food, he says, what if you would take a piece of metal and you'd warm up the metal? What happens when you take metal and you heat it up? It becomes soft. Metal is hard. And when you, when you heat it up enough, it turns red and it gets soft and you can, you can move it around. You can shape it into things. You can make a horseshoe, probably the best example we know of. So if what if you take a metal, a piece of metal, and you use heat to change it, or or you take a piece of metal and you heat it up to such an extent that it becomes like coal. This is considered an offshoot of cooking. What does he mean by an offshoot? Now the word toldos would be as if, let us say that we have a tree. And the trunk of the tree is the forbidden law of the, in the Torah of cooking something on Shabbos. He says, but if you were going to take a piece of metal and you were softening it with heat, that's not the Torah law of cooking. That is rabbinic law. It's an offset. It comes from this idea, the idea of using heat to change something, but it's different than actually cooking something. And then he says, shahari b'chemimo, who Marchavo she Roy Litakno. He says by heating up the metal, it becomes soft, and it now it becomes easy to shape it, to make it into what you want. So the Sosli Menu Kli, to make out of that piece of metal some type of an object, a spoon, a fork, a dish. You've made it by by, by making the metal soft. And that is forbidden uh, under the law of cooking. All right. Then he says. Which he says in parentheses is shava. Now he's, here he's saying also, if you soften wax, like from a candle, you use heat to soften wax. Here the word isn't chalav. It looks just like the word for milk, but it isn't. It's chalav, which is the exact same spelling. But here you have to know the context. And this is fat, like animal fat. So if you use heat, to melt wax or to melt fat, or as a zephes, or via gafaris, or you take tar or other um, or sulfur or other types of minerals or objects that by heating them up you somehow change them, and anything else like this, Harizet told us a Those are all rabbinically forbidden under the law of cooking. Vachayev. And now he says, oh, it's not just rabbinic. And, and now this is the Chiddush. That's why he's telling us this here. It's also forbidden by the Torah. Why? So then, and he says, another example would be, you take, a, you take dirt. Here he means moist clay. And you make a pot out of it. And then you take it and you put it in a kiln. Right here, you take fire in order to take this finished pot and to finish it, to make the last finish of it, right? Like you take a clay, you know, you, you want to make a vase, you make a vase out of clay, and then you put it in a, in a kiln and it makes it hard. He says, Chai of that is forbidden by the Torah also for as cooking. Why? He says, the kodus from hakli, he says, because if you take this, this clay and you put it in the oven before it becomes hard, it boils out 
all the droplets of water that are found within the clay. Like, what's the difference between the wet, moist clay that we make things out of and the final product? Is that, the, is that all of the liquid within the final product has been evaporated by heat. And so he's saying that that's why it's forbidden to actually make a pot on Shabbos. It's not forbidden and any other reason other than cooking, because you're using heat. Because you are cooking the actual liquid within the dirt or within the clay of this object. So now he's going to give us um, examples that are more pertinent to his time, but were not ancient. So he says, for instance, what if you take pieces of wood, uh, let's say you have a wood burning stove, and you want to burn wood, right? But not on Shabbos. You know you can't put wood in a stove on Shabbos. But you have all of this wood that you just gathered from outside. And you know there's a difference between wet wood and dry wood. Even wood that you've dried off still has moisture inside of it. And when you put it into a fireplace, it will, it'll pop, right? It won't cook evenly. It won't cook as well, right? The, the, the best type of wood to use is dried wood dried hardwood, but dried wood. And therefore, what people used to do is they would gather the wood, they'd make a pile of it next to their stove, and they'd leave it there. And, and by being next to the stove, it would heat up the wood and cause the moisture within the wood to dry. So he's saying, if you know Sinchatichos eats, but Tenor, if you put pieces of wood next to the oven, in order for that wood to become dry, you should know that the first thing that happens when you heat it up is that the liquid inside of it causes the wood to become soft, and it causes then the liquid within the wood evaporates. You have broken the Torah law of cooking. So now we've gone through a number of examples. Now the Mishnah Bura is going to give us in this introduction the general rule. What's the general rule? I don't need to go through every example in the world. If I put this by the fire, that by the fire, this in the fire, that in a pot, like it's too much. So give me a general rule. So he says, here is the general rule. Klal means general shel davar of this idea. Ben shirape guf kasha. It is inconsequential that if you would take something soft, something hard, and you make it soft, be'esh, with fire. So you have an object that's hard, and by, by putting it next to the fire or in the fire, it becomes soft, like many food products do, right? Oh, shetiksha guf rach, or you take something that has a soft body, it's soft, it's moist, right? And you put that by the fire, and then that becomes hard. Har is a chayv mesu mevasho. All of those things are forbidden for, because of cooking. So now you take any object. We're not just talking about food. We're talking about you walked outside in the rain and your suit jacket got wet. You take off your suit jacket, you put it next to the, the heat, the heater in your house or the heat in a, if you have a, um, a fireplace or you have a wood burning stove, you put it near there in order so that the water should evaporate. On Shabbos, you have broken the Torah by doing that. That's what he's saying. Anything that you take that you change it because of putting it by fire, right? Of changing it would be getting rid of water, right? That's forbidden by the Torah. So now we've we've only spoken so far about about you know, right about um, cooking and baking. So we now know that any type of use of fire in order to change something is forbidden. In the case of food, in the case of objects. In the case of inedible objects, in the case of something that's already edible, that is now becoming inedible, something that is edible but is becoming more edible, all of these are examples that are forbidden by the Torah. And then you, in parentheses it says, Rambam Perektov. This is the Rambam in the Laws of Shabbos in the ninth chapter. He now quoted verbatim the, the, the Rambam. He is not, this is not the words of the Mishnah Burr himself. He is quoting. Then he says, Al Korchach. Now, on the strength of what I just told you, or because of what I just told you, Yesh Lizaher Ma'od, you need to be extraordinarily careful. Shalo Lahaniach Eitzim Lachim Alatinort, to not take moist wood and put it near the stove, Levashan, in order to dry it out. Now, this is something 
that probably out of the 10 people in this class, maybe one of you have done some time in your life where you take moist wood and you put it next to the fireplace in order to get dry. But remember, we have gas, electric, um, other types of stoves. Back in those days, they had wood burning stoves. That's how they cooked. They used wood or they used coal, but primarily wood in order to, to make their, their fire, even to make their heat in their house. And if you have a wood burning stove, like when I lived in Colorado, I had a wood burning stove. And it wasn't, we didn't use it for food. We use it just for fun, but we had it in the living room and we'd fill it with wood. We'd light it on fire and it would heat up the house for probably about 15 hours. So right before Shabbos, we would do it. And then we'd sit in that room and we'd play a game or we'd learn or we'd read and, and it would stay warm and it would turn off the heat in the house because that was on. That was, and, and of course, we lived in Colorado, we would go gather wood. So I would not be allowed to take moist wood and put it next to the stove. Um, after the setting of the sun on Friday night, the Havi Chashash Teresa, because that is, here, chashash means there is a suspicion of you breaking the Torah. Doraisa is the Aramaic word for the Torah. Um, do means from, oraisa is Torah. Um, that's, it's a different word than we're used to, but it's Aramaic, not Hebrew. Haniach, basar, agabi gacholim. So now he's going to say, he's going to ask the following question. Remember, this is all going on the first word of their law. This whole section is just going on the word cook. Right, so now he says, what if you, if you take a piece of raw meat and you drop it on some hot coal? If it becomes totally cooked, kosher gereris. How, what does it mean? You take a piece of raw meat, you drop it on some hot coals. If you're doing so, causes the meat to become fully cooked at least the size of a pea on that meat. So you have a a steak that's big enough for you to eat, right? And you drop it on coal. And one piece of that meat literally touches the coal and it cooks the meat, right? But only the size of a pea, 99% of that meat's raw. You, you are chayef, you have broken the Torah. And don't think that this, the size of a pea, which is small enough, has to be in one place. It could be, in numerous places around this meat, if you would gather all the places where the meat cooked and it would all gather together to be the size of a pea on a piece of meat, big a tomahawk steak, right? A giant piece of meat. Nevertheless, when you gather it together, it's enough for that one bit. He says, um, it doesn't have to be in one place. It can come from two or three different places. You have also broken the Torah. Even if you have not cooked it fully, rock, now this abbreviation here, if you're following, is Kama'achel ben Dorsai. And if you don't know who he is, I'll have to tell you. If you know, forgive me for telling the story. But the Gomorrah talks about, has a question. How... Um, how much cooking is considered cooking on Shabbos? So we've talked about you can't cook it even if it's a seed, if it's a little bit, but what is considered cooked? Maybe if I just, you know, I heat, I, I, I put something into a, let's say on top of a heat, but it's not, it's only there for a second. It can't cook that fast. Is that forbidden? So, so what's the definition of cooked? So he says there's the definition is well cooked is fully cooked. If you like raw steak, so then a steak that's raw, that's, that's rare, let's say, it would be sufficiently cooked. Even if you like it fully, you know, like uh, really heavily cooked, still rare would be considered fully cooked. But along comes this fellow in the days of the Gomorrah, whose name was Ben Dorsai. And Ben Dorsai was what they called a highwayman. That was a thief. He lived on the highway with a bunch of other thieves. And when people would travel from one city to the next, he'd rob them. But the police were always chasing him. So he never had time for a regular meal. So he would go and he'd start a fire and he would put his food on the fire, but he'd always be looking over his shoulder that the police are coming. So after he would cook the food, either one half fully cooked or three quarters fully cooked, there's two opinions in the Gomorrah, which it is, either half fully or two thirds fully, then, and then he would eat it. 
So since he would eat it under duress, but he would eat it and became edible. So the definition of using fire to make something that was inedible, now edible, a piece of steak that eating it raw is really not edible, eating it cooked is edible. So it would be half or two thirds would be considered sufficient. That's called ma'achel ben dorsai, the food of the thief ben dorsai. Interesting enough, right? If it wasn't for this, nobody would ever know who Ben Dorsai was. He was certainly not an exemplary righteous person that we need to know. But the Gomorrah uses him as an example to tell you that if he would cook his food to this point, and then he wouldn't wait till it was fully cooked because he's afraid he'd get caught. So he would eat it at the, at the easiest possible moment. And that's where he, uh, that's, that's what the law, the law now uses that idea to teach us that if you cook something on Shabbos, to the point that it's Michael Ben Dorsai, then that's considered fully cooked on Shabbos, even if you wouldn't eat it. But if Ben Dorsai would eat it under duress, it's edible. That's all it has to be is edible. So he says, that's Gam Kem Chayev. That's also forbidden. Ella, the Bezeh, She'enu Tzoli Gemura, Tzarek Shia Habasar Tzali Meshnei Tzadadim, Shal Habasar, Dafka. So now he says, but there's another rule to understand. In the case where you only have the meat, where it's cooked, right, you know, the size of a pea in one area, that's if it's fully cooked in that area. But if let's say it's only cooked to Ben Dorsai in that one little pea-sized area. He says, in order for that to be forbidden by the Torah, it has to be cooked on both sides the same way. If it was cooked fully, it wouldn't have to be both sides. Let's say your meat is two inches thick, right? The size of a pea is, is like maybe a tenth of an inch. So, so that would be sufficient if you cooked it fully. But if you only cooked it to Ben Dorsai, you would have to go through and through to the other side, right? If not, you're Pator. What does Pator mean? So Pator is, again, a word that is only used with Torah law. If a person does something that, that they shouldn't do, but they're not held accountable for it, then that's called patur, right? You're excused from it. I, I, you know, I, I was busy helping somebody go to the hospital, and I missed the time for mincha. I couldn't have, I didn't have a mincha because I was bringing someone to the hospital. So I'm patur from mincha. I'm excused from mincha because I was doing something more important. I didn't forget it was I had a daven. I didn't ignore it. I didn't say I don't care. I had a mitzvah that preceded it, so that's patur. So here also he's saying, <clears throat> in the case of meat being ben dorsai, if it's only cooked on one side, you're excused. That's not sufficient for you to have broken the Torah. They came cuss of a Rambam, and the Rambam says that. Because that, all of this, hu le'inyan chatas. This is when we're talking about a chatas. What's a chatas? A chatas is a sin offering. He's using the expression of a sacrifice because he's talking about Torah law. If you break the Torah, you have to offer a sacrifice. If you break rabbinic law, you don't offer a sacrifice. So he's saying, all of this is only talking about Torah law. Oval is surah, but forbidden. Now, now remember I said, usher is rabbinic. So, but but is surah, yesh b'chol gavne. But being forbidden in every case. That is, if you drop a piece of meat on a coal, the moment it hits the coal, you, you broke the rabbinic law. The moment that it cooks, the size of a pea fully, then you broke Torah law. But it's forbidden to even put the meat down before it cooks. So you can't say, listen, I'll put it down for a second. It'll just warm it up a little bit and I'll grab it off before it cooks. You're not allowed to do that. That's rabbinically forbidden. Became Kosovo Rambam, Mechilis Le'inian Tzoli. The Rambam writes this also in regard to frying something. Hashir Grogreris, who gam came rock Le'inian Chayev Chatas. He says in the case of frying, it also means that if you're talking about the size of a pea or a seed, that's only forbidden by the Torah. And that is forbidden by the Torah, as we said. And then he has another idea. He says, So here's another law, which is, which is a very important law to know, no matter where you're learning Jewish law. And this law is, that there's, you have to do a certain amount of something wrong to have broken the Torah. For instance, in order to break the Torah 
for the law of writing on Shabbos. You have to write two letters. If you wrote one letter, then you didn't break the Torah. You broke rabbinic law because you're not allowed to write at all. But the Torah has an amount. Everything has an amount. So the amount that is forbidden of writing on Shabbos is two letters. Not one letter, but two letters. However, half of the amount is also forbidden by the Torah. The, the Torah makes a law that that is after the fact. After the fact, if you cooked enough to break the Torah, you broke the Torah. What if you didn't cook enough to break the Torah? You, you put the meat down. And then you realized, oh, I made a mistake, and you pull the meat off, and it didn't fully cook. Uh, so, so there you only broke rabbinic law. But what if you put it down, and you know you can't do it, and you do it on purpose, right? And then you, you pull it off, right, uh, before it gets fully cooked. So here the Torah has a rule that says, chetzi shir, half of the full amount is also forbidden. So if I told you, you're not allowed to write two letters on Shabbos, and if you write two letters on Shabbos, you broke the Torah. If you purposely write one letter on Shabbos, you also broke the Torah. How is that? Because, the, because you are approaching it. You're, get, you're purposely doing this right to the edge. You're practicing brinkmanship. You're going to the edge, to the brink. So the Torah says you can't do that. If it was a mistake and you caught yourself, then you didn't do anything wrong. But if it was purposeful, like let's say Mr. X puts a piece of meat on the coal and it's on Shabbos and he wants it to cook. And I walk into the room and I grab the meat off the fire, throw it away from the fire, right? And it only cooked a little, so he didn't break the law because I stopped it from happening. It wasn't my, right? It, I stopped it. There wasn't half a shear forbidden by the Torah. But it, had I not come in and the fire went out and it only cooked halfway, he still broke the Torah because it tells you that you have an amount that you can't do, but even playing around halfway is also forbidden by the Torah. Okay, now he goes on. Okay, that ends Aleph, number one. That we have now defined, according to the Shulchan Aruch, what the word means, hamavashel, that you cooked, right? We now know cooking means roasting, frying, baking, it doesn't just mean boiling, which the word mavasha literally means. And it says, bush Shabbos, we're going to talk about next. But, it, but what are you cooking? You're cooking food, for sure. You're cooking anything else. What is the definition? As he says, to take something hard and make it soft with fire, to take something soft and make it hard with fire, are both examples of cooking on Shabbos. You take a piece of metal and you make it soft with fire in order to fashion it, even if you don't fashion it, you cooked on Shabbos. If you take spice, spices and you, put, and you cook them, right? This is really incense it's talking about. And you cook it, right? You, you're, you're not really doing anything. You can't eat it, but nevertheless, that's forbidden. If you take tar and you heat it up purposefully, then you have broken Shabbos. So it's not just food. It's any object that you change by using fire on Shabbos is forbidden by the Torah on Shabbos. But they're just giving you an example. Why then, if that's the case, that any type of cooking is forbidden, why do they say bishel, boiling? Why don't they say roasting? Why, like, you want to pick one, why pick that one? Because that's the word that's in the Torah. The Torah itself uses the word bishel. Just like it says, Al Tevashel Gedi Bechale Vemo, Chale Vemo. Do not cook the baby in the mother's milk, right? Why does it say uh, there that cooking means boiling, right? What if I would, right? And that's logical because mother's milk is liquid. So of course you're going to cook it in liquid. But the word bishel there is literally means cooking. In this case, it means all forms of cooking. But that's the word that the Torah itself uses. Now, that is basically an introduction of the idea of a person um, starting to cook on Shabbos. Let me see, I got a question here. What about putting gloves over an air vent to dry out? That's exactly like the example of, of, of taking your jacket and putting it near the fire. It's actually forbidden. If you come in, and I know people aren't going to like this one, but if you come in after walking home from shul and your shoes are wet and you put them near the heating vent on Shabbos, you are cooking on Shabbos. 
right? You might not actually get to cooking on Shabbos. It might not be hot enough to do it, but that is your intent. Your intent is for the water to dry up. That's cooking. You may not accomplish it, so you might not have broken it. But the idea is, when I take my shoes off, I put them by the heating vent. The purpose is to melt the snow, to evaporate the water, so hopefully my shoes aren't ruined. That's forbidden to do on Shabbos. So we're not allowed to do that. That's a good example. Okay, now we have to define what is Shabbos. I don't mean, you know, versus a weekday, but when does it start? What if I, if Shabbos, right, is, you know, like we have what you call Ben Hashmashos. The expression Ben Hashmashos means between the suns. Shemesh is a sun, between the suns. We only have one sun, but it means at the time of twilight, where it's not daytime, it's not nighttime, it's sort of half and half. It's after sunset, but it's, but you can still see the sun. Is, and what if you cook then? Is that considered cooking on Shabbos? What about after sunset, but before 42 minutes or 72 minutes? Is that cooking on Shabbos? What is the definition of Shabbos? Right? What do we literally mean? Because we, we have to be very precise with halacha. This is not philosophy where you can play around different opinions. This is, this is law. Now, there are different opinions in law, but it's black and white. So now we're going to look at number two at base where it talks about Shabbos. So here he says, bis Shabbos, on Shabbos. Vikal shiyesh suffik pelukta bezeh, ihavi klal bishur olav, oshar malachos kahai gavna, ein la asr bidyeved, vikal ha isr hazeh hu rak midurabonim. So he says, if you, if, if you have a time where it's suffik plugasa, that means that Vugasa is the Aramaic word meaning between the suns. It's questionable. Is, is it, is, did Shabbos start yet or not? I'm not really sure. You know, it's supposed to start exactly at 642, but, is it, but it looks so light out. If maybe it isn't started yet. Maybe it did start yet. Maybe we don't have clocks. We're looking at the scar, stars. When does it actually begin? So if it is at a time that the halacha tells you is a questionable time, the, the, the time between the two sons, Bein HaShemashos, is questionable. Halakha says, we don't know if that's Shabbos or not. We should be strict just in case, but we don't know for sure. So he's saying, what if you did this at that time? So he says, it's forbidden, but, but he says, it's Madurabanan Shekansu, Vesveke Durabanan Lakula. So he says, if you did it during that time, you shouldn't. But if you did, you, it's still something, you can still use it because it was only rabbinic. And a question of rabbinics is lenient. Let me tell you, this is a general rule, which I'm sure you've heard, but let me tell you how this works. There's, a, there's what if you have a question on anything in Jewish law and you can't get the answer or there isn't an answer, right? We just don't know for sure. So if it's a Torah law and you have a question, here's a, an example. Let us say, you have to say the Shema in the morning, and you have to say it every morning. That's a Torah mitzvah. So you got up and you said Shema. You don't know, though, if it was too late. Maybe it was too late. Maybe it was after the time to say Shema. You said it too late, right? Or you said Shema, and now it's 10 hours later, and you forgot if you said Shema. Here's a better, a little bit crazier example, but a better one. You forgot. You, I go to you and I say, did you say Shema today? And you go, I don't remember. Did I say it or did I not say it? So since Shema is a Torah law, we're strict. And we say, then you have to say Shema again. You, you didn't say it. You, maybe you said it. Maybe you didn't. But if you have a question about a Torah law, you are required to do it again. But if you have a question about a rabbinic law, you are, you are required to not do it again. Because what happens if I was saying, uh, Shmon Esrei is rabbinic, and you don't remember if you said Shachris or not. I, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes, but let's say you don't know if you said Shachris or not. You didn't pray. You don't know if you said Shmon Esrei, but Shmon Esrei is rabbinic. If you are strict on yourself and you did say it, then you'll be saying the words and the blessings for no purpose. Those are blessings levatola. But if you didn't say it and you do say it, you fulfill it. So, but if it's because it's rabbinic and you don't know the answer if you did or you didn't, then we're lenient and we say you don't do it. So in the case of what we call benosh mashos, we don't know if it's daytime or nighttime. The law is you're supposed to keep Shabbos as if it's Shabbos. 
But what if you made a mistake? What if you, you were preparing and you suddenly looked up and you're in Benish Moshos? You didn't realize it. You thought you were supposed to go to shul. You got late. You didn't realize it. Now you look and you realize it's one minute right, you're into Benish Moshos. Can I eat this food? Can I add this food? What do I do? So he says, because it's rabbinic, we're lenient and it's okay. You can't do it. But if you did it, you're allowed to use it. Now, why I'm telling you you're allowed to use it is because of the rest of the law, which I'll, even we won't be able to get into it all, I'm going to at least give you an idea about what the rest of the law says so you have to know what we're going to get into. So now he's saying, um, all right, so, so when he says Shabbos, he just defined to us, he means literally it's Shabbos. In other words, it's not after sunset, before you made Havdalah, it's not before sunset or just around sunset and you're not sure. Either way, that, that, right, you, that's rabbinic. If you know it's Shabbos and it's a Torah law, then you broke the Torah law and, and all of these penalties that we'll talk about will apply. If you don't know, because it's, it's not that you don't know, but it is unknown, if when you did it, is it actually is after sunset before you before 42 minutes or before 72 minutes, is that literally Shabbos? You're supposed to act that way. But if you didn't and you made a mistake, it's rabbinic and you'd be allowed to use it. Right. So that that's what that's his definition of Shabbos. So then he goes on uh, and he, he talks about next, he says, I'm a Vashel Shabbos, you cook on Shabbos, O Sha'asa Echas Nashar Malachos or you do any other malacha. So let's now understand. He says, you do any one of the other malacha. Malacha means work. Here it's talking about the forbidden, the lamed taste malachas, 39 forms of forbidden activity on Shabbos. You've done one of those things, right? So here this section only talks about cooking, but he's saying, no, this can be extrapolated to any law of Shabbos, cooking, Right is certainly one, borer. Right, choosing is another one. Dying things could be another. Um, you know all of the different laws that we have of uh, starting a fire, putting out a fire. All of these different things. Right, they all apply to the same rule. Now, what is this rule? So let me give you an idea about it. Uh, rather than going into the Mishnah Bura, let's read the rest of the top of the page, which is the top of the page is actually the Shulchan Aruch written by Rabbi Yosef Karo in Sfat in the Middle Ages. Yosef Karo actually wrote this book for children and women because the average man could read the Talmud and, and he knew what, it was able to discern from the Talmud what the halacha was. Um, about two generations before him, it became clear that, that nobody, people could not, the average person could not do that anymore. The average person could not take the Gemara and, and learn the halacha from it. Certain people could, they were knowledgeable enough, the average person couldn't. So the Rambam was one of the first to codify the entire Talmud and tell you what the law was. The Shulchan Aruch took three different major authorities, the Rif, the Rush, and the Rambam, three great authorities of that era, and he basically took two out of three, and that's what he followed. You take those three opinions, you argue back and forth, you come up with what you think is the right one. If you don't have a rationale, then the, then the majority wins. But if he has a rationale, he would sometimes go against the majority. So the Shulchan Aruch wrote this for people who could not look into the Talmud and get the answer. So now he's, uh, then, then you have other people who added to it. The Mr. Burr, of course, was a thousand years later. But here, so he goes on. After he talks about cooking on Shabbos, and also you should know that this applies to every type of forbidden activity on Shabbos, bemazed. You did it on purpose, as I said before, with malice and forethought. That is, you know you can't cook on Shabbos, and you said, and and you you walk into the kitchen in the morning and you see that the chilling pot didn't go on last night, and you say nobody's going to see me. I got ten guests coming over, and you plug it in. Right? You have now purposefully broken Shabbos. Bemazed means literally on purpose. Then that food is not, now what we're going to have is, and we're, we're, I'm just going to read this to you because. I'm going to have to go through two Gomorrahs for you to truly understand this and for all of us to understand it, which will take us a whole class. But I'm going to go through the idea. He says the following. He says that, that there's a penalty 
Right? If you break Shabbos, if you cook something on Shabbos, so the law says you can't just do that and then just eat it, even you did something wrong, and but then just eat it. But he says, if you broke Shabbos on purpose and there was some type of benefit, like you cooked a steak on Shabbos, it is forbidden for you forever to eat that steak. That's what it says. Usr, it says, but maize it on purpose, usr lowly olam. It is forbidden for that person who did it forever. He's never allowed to eat that piece of steak. But what about the guests? They didn't do anything wrong. And they're sitting at the table waiting to eat dinner. They're allowed to eat it, but only Saturday night. That's according to this opinion, by the way. Don't start, even though we're not going to finish this, don't start poskening this way. Don't follow this yet. We're not done. So he's saying it is, for, it is, it is, permiss, it is permissible for everyone else on Saturday night immediately. So on Saturday night, why? Because you're, you're, the penalty of the other people, it doesn't exist. They didn't do anything wrong. It's the host who did something wrong. And therefore he's penalized that his guests can't eat it on Shabbos. And we, as God-fearing people, don't want to benefit from someone breaking Shabbos. So we don't, we're not allowed to eat it. But why does he say immediately? Well, there's an extra word here, miyad, immediately. And this is because, and I'm sure this is going to come to your mind, there is a rule in the laws of Shabbos, laws of Shabbos and in many places, that if a person cooks on, on Shabbos, you have to now wait the amount of time after Shabbos that it would take to cook the food, and then you could eat it. Otherwise, you are benefiting from cooking on Shabbos. Right? However, we, I'm, uh, you might have heard this law. This law only applies to a non-Jew. That is, if you go to a non-Jew and say, listen, you don't have to keep Shabbos, I do. Would you mind going to my backyard, start up the barbecue grill, make me a steak, make yourself one too, let's be nice. You get one, I get one, then let's have a steak, right? Well, did a Jew cook on Shabbos? Nope. Did, it? did a Jew benefit from breaking Shabbos? No. The non-Jew doesn't have to keep Shabbos, right? So the rabbis don't want people to do this, so they made a rule that if you do that, you are penalized that not only do you have to wait till after Shabbos to eat that steak, you have to wait the amount of time it would take you to make that steak after Shabbos ended. However, it's a very interesting law. It says by a Jew. It says if you would go to a non-Jew who doesn't know better and you'd say, listen, go cook a steak for me on Shabbos, they might do it just because you asked them. But if you go to a Jew, the Talmud says, the Jew, he will not break the Torah for nothing. You're going to have to pay him. The Jew won't do it for free. He's going to say, what, you want me to break Shabbos so you can keep Shabbos? Oh, no, I'm not doing that. Right? It says, it says that he won't break the, the Torah, the low, low, if he gets nothing for it. So, so therefore, we're, the rabbis weren't worried that you could go to a Jew and say, cook for me on Shabbos, and the Jew would cook for you on Shabbos. Um, he would say, forget it. Why should I cook for you on Shabbos? You're such a from guy. Then you pay me and then I'll cook for you on Shabbos. But or, I'm not going to do it just because you want me to. Why should I have the penalty and you should get the steak? Right? So a Jew wouldn't do it. So therefore, you don't have to wait the amount of time after Shabbos if it happened where a Jew cooked on Shabbos. You, only have, you have to wait till Saturday night. It's only with a non-Jew is there an additional penalty of having to wait what's called Kadesh Asu the amount of time it takes to prepare the food. So that's why it says here immediately. And then he says, Vashogi. Now what happens if the person, and this is, this is going to happen in our lives, does it by mistake. They don't know a law. For instance, there's a law. You're not supposed to stir soup on Shabbos on the fire. If it's still on the fire, you're not supposed to stir it. Right, because it says you, the stuff that's on the bottom will go on the top, the stuff on the top will go on the bottom, and you're cooking it better by stirring it, which is why people stir things. So on that basis, right, you're you're, you're not allowed to 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 stir something on Shabbos. Let's say you get invited to someone's house and they don't know that law; they're not breaking the Torah purposefully. They don't know. They don't know you're not allowed to do that, and they do it. And you're sitting at the table and you look over into the kitchen. And you notice that the, the woman of the household is stirring the soup on the fire. And now you're sitting there with waiting for your soup to come. And you're saying, she just broke Shabbos. I'm not going to be able to eat this food till after Shabbos. I'm going to insult her and not eat the food. How can I do that? And if I eat the food, I'm breaking Shabbos. 
to lie is no. That's only if she did it on purpose. She knew better and she didn't care. Then you couldn't eat the food till after Shabbos. But here it says, Beshogeg, what if they did it by mistake? She forgot it was Shabbos or she didn't know it was forbidden to do on Shabbos. Usr Bobiyom, it is forbidden for that person on Shabbos to eat it. With Gamla Acherin. And for other people, they also can't. But they were the heir of Mutter Gamlo. But Saturday night, everyone can eat it. So here the opinion is, and by the way, this is not the way we follow. You don't, you don't have to wait till we get into the Gamor and the Mishabur to understand it. But it, they say, if she does it on purpose, it's forbidden for her forever or for him forever. And for you, Saturday night, you can eat it. If the person did it by mistake, it's forbidden for them and for you until Saturday night, but then anyone can eat it, right? So that, that's what he says here. Um, he says, Gam l'acherim l'erev mutter gam lo ma'ad. Immediately they can have it. V'im amr le'enu Yehudi. But what if you say to a non-Jew, la'asos l'malachu b'shabbos, do this forbidden act for me on Shabbos. I am la'ayah, look ahead and I'll tell you there. So I already told you what it says there, which is there's an extra penalty. So here, here's what we've got. What we're going to learn in the Gomorrah, and we're going to do this next week, is that there are three opinions in the Gomorrah of, two, of, two, of these rabbis arguing. What is the penalty for cooking on Shabbos? One says, you can't eat it until Saturday night. You can't, no, excuse me, do it on purpose. You never can eat the food. And everyone else has to wait till Saturday night. That's the strictest opinion. The second opinion is, is that you can't eat it ever because you did it on purpose, but everyone else can eat it on Shabbos. That's the second opinion. Then the third opinion is everyone can eat it on Shabbos. Now that you'll have to understand the Gomorrah, which explains all three opinions and they argue back and forth and prove and disprove each other. There are nine various responses to this Gomorrah. It's found in Gomorrah Chulin and Gomorrah, um, Gomorrah Shabbos, Tessai and Ahmed Beis and Shabbos and Chaf Aleph and Hulin. Those two places, you find the same Gomorrah with the same response um, for different purposes. And they go through all these different opinions. They're dealing with, at this point, they're not dealing with breaking Shabbos, right? We're, we're breaking with the penalty of someone who broke Shabbos. Is there a penalty? And so now, since we're saying that this doesn't only apply to cooking, this applies to everything, any law that a person breaks on Shabbos has this rule. So if a person writes on Shabbos, right? So, so what they're writing on Shabbos is forbidden to them. And you can't benefit it from it until after Shabbos. Let's say somebody's, you know, let's say some, somebody's spouse is an observant. And, she, and, and you're going to come home from shul and you expect her to be home. But she decides she's going to go take a walk. So she writes a note, you know, uh, I'll be back later, right? So that act that she does is forbidden, but it's shogeg because she doesn't know better. She's not religious. She doesn't understand what she's doing. So therefore you, right? She, what she's doing is wrong, but you can benefit from it. You can read it. You can't encourage it because you're causing someone you care for to do something wrong. But, you, but there is still the idea of the penalty. In any law that has to do with Shabbos, there are these penalties. The strictest one is the one that the Shulchan Aruch writes here. The Vilna who who, uh, who is in agreement, by the way, with the Alter Rebbe of Lubavitch. Where everybody likes to talk about how the Alter Rebbe of Lubavitch and the Vilna fought with each other all the time. But I can tell you, besides the fact that they didn't live at the same time, um, that they actually were both unique authorities of Jewish law, brilliant authorities of Jewish law. And many, 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 many times that they will differ with the norm, they will both do it together at the same way without knowing about each other, right? The, the Lubavitcher Rebbe will say X, Y, and Z. Everyone else in the world will say A, B, C, except the Vilna Gon will also say X, Y, Z, right? They find it all the time. So the Vilna Gon and the Lubavitcher Rebbe take the more lenient opinion, as does the Shulchan, as, as does the Mishnah Burra, and we'll find out why. Right. Well, we're going to we, we could, we're going to do that one next week, and I will have a copy of the Gomorrah, which I will put, send out uh, of that page, as well as the continuation of the Shulchan Aruch and Mishnah Burra. Because the truth is, if you don't understand the Gomorrah, it's much harder to understand the halacha. Right. But most of us are used to looking at things like the English halachas 
or the Kitzer Shulchan Aruch, and it's really not a good way to learn halacha. Because in order to truly understand halacha and in order to apply it in different areas, you need to go all the way back to the Gemara. You go from the Gemara to the commentaries in the Gemara to the early uh, halacha authorities and then to the later halacha authorities. The later ones being the Mishnabura, the earlier ones being the Rambam, the Ran, the, the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch is even a later one but because he's using the earlier ones. But that's really how we figure out halacha. So that's what we're going to do next week. But I just wanted to give you an introduction this week to the idea of cooking. And even though we're talking about cooking, this can be extrapolated to everywhere else. This is where the whole concept of a halachic penalty comes in in all of halacha, comes from this law. Right? Anywhere in halacha where there's a penalty on the person who does something wrong, it's coming from this. This is coming from the Gemara in Chulin and in Shabbos. And, and you'll, see, you'll see how that works. All right, so that, um, that really concludes the Aleph. So for next week, we're going to do the, I'm gonna go through the Gemara, you're gonna explain, I'm gonna explain Aleph better. That means the first halacha better. And if we have time, then we're gonna talk about uh, number two. I was gonna give you a taste of it. Number two is if you have a sick person and you're allowed to break Shabbos for that sick person, so can you benefit from it as well? So for instance, the example that they give here is that the doctor says that you have to, you have to shecht a cow and this sick person needs to eat the meat from a cow that was shechted 20 minutes ago. You can't wait. It has to be only 20 minutes old. So you have to shecht it on Shabbos because it's Shabbos, right? But if you shecht the cow, right? He's not going to eat the whole cow. Now you got a dead cow. So maybe could you have a little bit too? Maybe you want some. Or a better example would be eggs. The doctor says you have to make eggs for the guy. <coughs> so, okay, you make three eggs. He only eats two. Can you eat the third one? Right? How about if you, you, he says make, you can make eggs for him and you say, you know what? I'll throw in an extra one anyways. Right? What the heck? I'm, I'm allowed to cook. I'm cooking for a mitzvah. Maybe I throw in an extra egg. I can now have, I can now have three eggs and I'll eat an egg and it's permissible. I have a fresh egg just cooked now on Shabbos. Perfect, right? I can bake a challah on Shabbos. I can do anything on Shabbos if it's for a sick person or not. So we're, we'll, talk, we'll touch that now. So th this is basically the, uh, my, my idea of how I wanna go through this. I hope you find it interesting. I do uh, very much, I will, I will make sure that next, this week I wasn't able to get into the office. I had a bunch of personal things that went on. So I will make sure that next week we will have proper photocopies of everything for everyone. Um, I'll try with English Hebrew versions of everything. Um, but, but our goal is to really learn halacha the way you learn it, like, you know, the third, fourth year in, in Yeshiva Gadola already, when you're already have a basis in Gomorrah, have a basis in halacha. So now we're going to learn halacha more in depth, not just the end results, but the idea behind it. So if you, at the end of this, like right now with you can't really do it yet, but by next week, you should be able to know how to apply the law of somebody doing something by mistake, if you can use it or not, and when you can use it and when you can't use it and so forth. And I think you'll find that that will be very helpful. And it's something that happens all the time. All the time I go to people's houses and they make mistakes. And, I, and, and, and you know, it would be a real problem if, it, if I, I wouldn't be able to eat the food because they made a mistake. It's different that if I, I can't eat the food because they purposely did it. But if you made a mistake, right, you would only know that from here. All right. It's also the question that I just got to today, and I'll end with that, which is um, where somebody somebody invited somebody to their house for Shabbos, and they drove over on Shabbos with a cake. And they gave them a kosher cake on Shabbos, but they only brought it to their house by driving. So they wouldn't have gotten the cake if that person didn't drive. So that person broke Shabbos by mistake because they don't know better. They know you're not supposed to, but they don't really believe. But are you allowed to eat that cake or not? Did the, the, did the cake change any by them by them bringing it? Did it not change? Does it matter, right? Those are all gonna be issues. That's what this is gonna deal with. So I wanna make it so that you'll be able to answer those questions yourself. You won't need to, I'm glad to have you ask me, but you won't need to, to you'll be able to ask me. And then after that, know how to apply it every case here on your own. All right. So I hope everyone enjoyed our time together and um, we'll meet again the same time next week. I will be making these 
videos available on our YouTube page, which will be publicized in a couple of days, um, especially for those people who want to use this for their hours that they dedicated on Simcha's Torah. Here we're we're, we're we're going to do serious Torah learning where you'll be able to really, if you go through this for a while, I can assure you that um, you will get a much gra better grasp of how halacha works, understand what an argument is, understand what different opinions are and how they apply, and, and, then, and then how we're supposed to do it. Okay, so thank you all very much for joining me. I hope you found it worthwhile. And the best way to know is if you come back next week. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. And any questions, just send them to me. I'm glad to answer them. All right, have a good night. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Have a good night. Bye.